Mark went on to an amazing career as chief speechwriter for U.S. Senator Jesse Helms on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, then for Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld at the Pentagon, and finally for President George W. Bush in the White House. After leaving the White House, Mark wrote a best-selling book revealing some, some of the inside scoop on the war on terror. He followed that up with the bestseller, Unintimidated, which he co-authored with, with, with Wisconsin Governor and 2016 presidential hopeful Scott Walker. As a favor to me, he's uh, worn each of the six colors of the ISI necktie uh, on Fox News uh, several times. And uh, I'm shocked that he does any of this for me because he told me that all of the, uh, from, uh, of all the important political leaders that he's worked for, I was still his harshest editor. <laughs> <laughs> I, I told uh, Mark's wife, Pam, who's with us uh, tonight, that, you know, when I first met this guy, I didn't think he was going to amount to much. <laughs> but seriously, Mark is a wonderful guy, and, you know, he's a big shot now. He's on the Kelly file with Megyn Kelly a few times a week, and... Uh, he gets paid a lot of money to get up here and give these uh, speeches like the one he's going to give tonight. So I, uh, I called him up and I said, Mark, uh, do you believe in free speech? <laughs> and there was a pause and he said, yes, of course. And uh, I said, well, that's good. I'd like you to give one uh, tonight in Wilmington. <laughs> so without further ado, please welcome uh, my good friend Mark Thiessen. Thank you, Chris, and I promise the speech will be worth every penny. <laughs> it's, uh, it's great to be with you here tonight. Uh, Chris, thanks so much for that introduction. Uh, we've known each other a long time. Uh, we first met when Chris was running the Collegiate Networks newspaper at GW, and I was running the Vassar Spectator, and we met at one of these conferences, and here we are, as he thankfully mentioned 25 years later. Uh, at, a, uh, at a ISI event, so it's wonderful. Um, I'm so pleased that he's heading ISI and so honored that he asked me to serve on the board. Uh, I was fascinated uh, to learn from ALF that uh, Chris uh, had raised the value of, in just a few short years of Foster Freeze's assets to $19 billion. I was talking to Chris and he assures me that he will do the same for the ISI endowment in a few short years. <laughs> no pressure, Chris. Um, but anyway, he, he, Chris asked me to talk to you tonight uh, a little bit about my career and the role that ISI and the Collegiate Network played, and also tell you, take you behind the scenes a little bit in the White House and the Pentagon and some of the experiences I had there. Uh, and I'm pleased to do that, and uh, particularly because I love ISI and I love the Collegiate Network because it's really where I, where I got my start. It was as a Collegiate Network editor that I discovered my love of writing. Um, it was as a Collegiate Network editor that I discovered the world of ideas, all the books that ISI sent me that never seemed to get assigned in the classroom. Um, and I'll talk, tell you the impact of one of those books in a few minutes. Um, it was as a Collegiate Network editor that I first came to Washington. Uh, in 1988, I, was a, I had a Collegiate Network internship uh, in the last year of the Reagan administration. So I can claim to be a Reagan alumni just for, thanks to Collegiate Network. And uh, that gave me the, a taste of what it was like to work in the White House and serve my country in that capacity. And I, I sort of thought to myself, I might do it again one day if I had the chance, and, and, I, and I did. Um, so uh, so that, was, that was all because of the Collegiate Network. And then uh, it was as a Collegiate Network that I got to know the mentor uh, who helped me get started in my writing career and in my, in my, in my career in politics and conservative cause. Uh, the man whose uh, name uh, we we all recognize this weekend for the for the society that we're that you are so many of you are members of Bill Buckley. Um, back in 1987, I was a junior at Vassar College and just as had just taken over as editor in chief of the Vassar Spectator. Uh, back then, uh, we had uh, regional collegiate network conferences, and Chris and I actually met, as I said, in one of those. But we never we didn't have a national uh, network conference. I thought we ought to have one. And by the, while we're at it, uh, I thought we ought to have a national newspaper uh, the, for the, the, uh, that took all the talents of all these great editors and put them and created a national newspaper. And so at one of some of these regional conferences, I, I talked to Chris and a couple other folks and said, you know, we ought to have this conference and, you know, let's host it at Vassar. And so I convinced, amazingly, Vassar to give me some money. Uh, it wasn't as hard to convince the Collegiate Network, but they gave us a small sum of money. And so we were off. But my fellow editors gave me a challenge. They said, if you're going to have a national meeting of conservative college newspaper editors, you got to get Bill Buckley. And so 
I said, okay, uh, problem is, I don't know Bill Buckley. <laughs> and I don't know anybody who knows Bill Buckley. <laughs> so, so, you know, so I, I wasn't a very shy guy, so I, I, I picked up the phone and called National Review and said, uh, so how do you get Bill Buckley to come to your college campus? And they said, just a minute. And they put me on hold and transferred me to Francis Bronson, his assistant. Uh, and for those who, I'm sure many people in the room uh, know Frances, uh, she was totally unimpressed with me uh, and, and, and told me to call Bill's agent, which I did, who quoted me a sum that was about 10 times the annual operating budget of the Vassar Spectator. So it appeared I had reached a dead end. Um, but I was just absolutely convinced that if I had the chance to plead my case directly to Bill Buckley, Bill Buckley would come, that this was just right up his alley. I knew he believed in what we were doing. I just had to get to him. But how do you, how do you get to Bill Buckley? And one of my editors finally came up with the idea, let's get tickets to Firing Line. Let's just show up. So I said, OK. So you know, if we call PBS, like, how do you get tickets to Firing Line? And they said, oh, you just you know, come and you know, sign up and like that. So I went down to the studio and signed up for you know, four tickets for four of us editors and showed up at the taping of Firing Line. And so they were taping two shows back to back. And I summoned up my courage, and I saw Bill Buckley. Now, you know, if, if the sum of your, I'd never met Bill Buckley, I've watched him on TV, but if the sum of your you know, knowledge of Bill Buckley was watching him fillet his opponents in a firing line debate, he's pretty intimidating. <laughs> Smartest man in the world. Um, and so I just summoned up my courage and went up to him and introduced myself. I said, I'm Mark Thiessen, I'm the editor of the conservative newspaper at Vassar College. And he just looked at me and smiled in those twinkling blue eyes and said, oh, that's wonderful. Come here, to, come talk to me. Put the taping on hold, took me to the back room in his office and sat down, tell me, tell me all about the spectator. Tell me what you're doing. What's, it, what's conservatism like at Vassar College? And he was fascinated by the idea of a conservative newspaper at Vassar College. He always, until the end of his, li his life, he called me his Vassar friend. <laughs> Um, because he had met his sister Tish went to Vassar and he had met his wife Pat at Vassar and I didn't know this at the time but he was very intrigued by Vassar and he liked the idea of a national co a meeting of this so he said Here, write me a letter uh, send it to National Review not to my agent and I'll look at my calendar and see if I'll get back to you and so I, I sent the letter explained what we were planning to do and a few weeks later a, a letter comes in the mail from Bill Buckley saying I'll be happy to happy to come and so he came so uh, amazingly, the, the, he, he, uh, he arrived on campus, um, and so we got 60, about 60 editors from all these different conservative papers come to come to Vassar, um, and, and Bill arrives, and immediately the left sends a disturbance in the force. <laughs> and the word spreads around campus that Bill Buckley is here. And, and so they had, it was the night of the, of the, uh, the formal dance. And so, and, and it was pouring rain, and so they assembled this ragtag group of 300 students to come and protest our dinner. So we, we had it in this room called Jocelyn Hall, which is this beautiful old ornate room that was a long room with glass windows on either side. And Bill arrives, and we take him through a back entrance. There are 300 students outside chanting and, and, and all sorts of left-wing slogans. And, they, and so we're inside, and this is back when you could smoke a cigar indoors. Uh, and we're, we all we had gotten cigars. We we had wine. There were two these two twins on our newspapers who were were in the in the music program, so they were playing Mozart in the background. And so we're sitting there smoking cigars, drinking wine, hanging out with Bill Buckley. And by the glass, with their noses pressed against the glass, was the campus left, <laughs> looking in at us. <laughs> it was it was just too uh, too precious to me. But they were very upset, and they were very upset that they couldn't attend. And, 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 and so they, they, eventually they stormed the building and they came into the lobby, rushed into the lobby and they were prevented only from entering the hall by the efforts of the Vassar men's rugby team. <laughs> That's a real thing. <laughs> And uh, so they, they, Vassar Meng's rugby team held them off at the doors, but one of them snuck down into the, just as Bill went, stood up to speak, one of them snuck down into the basement and pulled the plug, so the whole room went dark. And Bob Terrell, the editor of the, uh, of the American Spectator then, was, was there. And so his voice comes out from the darkness, Bill, the Vassar student body is trying to show us how they see the world. <laughs> <laughs> And so we eventually got the lights back on, and Bill 
Bill enthralled his audience, and uh, it, was, it, was an, it was truly a, a night to remember. Um, and after that, we kept in touch. I would send Bill copies of the Vassar Spectator. He always would send a, a letter back with some uh, nice comment about an article that had been in there. They took the time to read it. Um, and, uh, and the following year, we got into a little tiff with the administration. They didn't like an article we published. They took away all of our money and told us to stop publishing and kicked us out of our offices. Uh, and so I reached out to Bill, and he uh, used his Vassar connections to uh, find an alumna who wanted to remain anonymous but gave us a, a, a sizable check to keep the paper operating, and so we did and got it back and took it independent of the campus, uh, which is what every conservative newspaper should be, independent of the college if it can be. Um, and, you know, so he came to the rescue uh, then. And then on graduating, I, I headed to Washington and landed a, a, a prize job with a Republican strategist char named Charlie Black, uh, thanks largely to a letter that Bill wrote for me, telling, telling Charlie uh, about some of the things that he had got, how he had gotten to know me and recommended me. So it got me my first job in Washington, really. I mean, Charlie told me there were lots of people applying to his job. He got a letter from Bill Buckley. He said, stop the interviews. If Bill Buckley says this guy's okay, he's okay, and, and hired me on the spot um, without even having talked to me. Um, so that, that was the power of that mentoring relationship that I had that I'd gotten through the collegiate network. Um, and so, uh, you know, I later went to work for uh, another great conservative icon, Senator Jesse Helms, uh, who was the chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee. And when I was working for Senator Helms, uh, one of the things I got to do is I went on a, a official uh, U.S. government visit to Cuba uh, for the, uh, for the uh, visit of Pope John Paul II. Um, and it just so happened that Bill had sailed to Havana for the same event. And so I had a wonderful lunch with Bill Buckley at, in Havana, Cuba. Um, and uh, it was one of the most memorable experiences of my life. And of course, Bill was, I was working for Senator Helms, who was the chief uh, architect and proponent of the Cuban embargo. And Bill was against the embargo. And so we had a fascinating debate in the Melia Cohiba Hotel. I can't imagine what Cuban intelligence thought of that. <laughs> um, and it was one of my greatest accomplishments as a, as a, as a, as a, as a wordsmith because I was the only time I ever corrected Bill Buckley's English. Bill kept referring to it as the Cuban blockade. At that. And I said, no, Bill, a blockade is when Navy ships encircle a port. An embargo, it's an embargo, a legal ban on trade. And he actually published that I had done that in National Review. It's one of my, one of my greatest accomplishments. I worked in the White House, I worked for the President, but I corrected Bill Buckley's English. <laughs> so, so that was a wonderful experience. Um, and uh, you know, after that, you know, Castro survived our visit. Um, and uh, I went, uh, went on to, uh, to uh, work in the, uh, in the Bush administration. Uh, I served three years uh, with, with Don Rumsfeld as his chief speechwriter um, there. I was uh, in the Pentagon on September 11th uh, when the plane hit. Um, and that was a, one of the most, I mean, everybody, it was the most stunning day in all of our lives. But I mean, I literally, it was two corridors down from me. And I, I felt the building shake. I smelled the smoke. Uh, and, uh, and lost a good friend uh, who had been down the hall that day. And so I was there literally at the very start of the war on terror um, and was with Rumsfeld for three years in the Pentagon uh, in, in that period. Uh, I traveled 250,000 miles with him over, over, uh, to over 50 countries in three years, uh, including the, his first visits into, into Kabul after the fall of the Taliban. Uh, to Bagram Air Base, uh, his first visit into Iraq uh, after the statue fell of Saddam Hussein, uh, and, and, and got to really be, have a front row seat uh, in history. Uh, be, and it was, it was a, a fascinating experience. I was, I was on the bus coming over here and talking with uh, some of my fellow trustees who know Don, and uh, we, were, we were telling Rumsfeld stories, and they suggested I share a few with you. And, uh, and uh, he's a fascinating man. I mean, everybody remembers his press conferences, of course. Um, but I got to, you know, when I was traveling with him, I would get the chance to sit with him when he, when he was having private meetings with kings and, and, and emirs and, and, uh, and world leaders um, and see how he interacted with them. And I remember back then, Central Asia, we know when, when, once we were in Afghanistan, Central Asia was a big focus and we were building relationships with all these countries in, the, uh, in the, uh, all these new Central Asian, former Soviet Central Asian republics. 
And so he would sit down with these, with these leaders and we were sort of trying to build new American relations with, with these countries where we had never had relations before, military basing, tra all these things. And I remember, I think we were in Kazakhstan and he sat down with the leader of Kazakhstan and he tried to prepare him for what it was like to have a relationship with the United States of America. And he told him, and this is almost verbatim, he said, getting into a relationship with America is like getting into bed with a hippopotamus. At first it feels all warm and fuzzy, but then the son of a bitch rolls over on top of you. And the worst part is he doesn't even know you're there. <laughs> that, which, is a, which is a pretty good description of, of uh, sometimes how we treat uh, some of the smaller countries that we have to deal with. Um, he also, I remember, and since we're in Delaware, I have to share this story, I was with him in Ethiopia, in Addis Ababa, with the, with the, uh, with the prime minister of Ethiopia. And uh, Rumsfeld, he liked to, he, I mean, he had strong opinions on how, to, how organizations should run themselves and all that, and he, he liked to give free advice. And he was giving the Prime Minister of Ethiopia free advice on how he could uh, improve his country. Um, and one of the things he, he told him was, he said, when I was, when I was a businessman, I could invest my money anywhere I wanted to and in any country I wanted to. And he was a CEO of, of several major companies. And he said, and I did it based on impressions that I had. And we have a state in our country called Delaware. And Delaware decided that they wanted to be the place where all the banks in the world and all the businesses and the corporations in the world came to set up shop. And so they created their laws in a way that made them the most attractive place to invest. He said, you want to be the Delaware of Africa. <laughs> Yeah. So, you know, it's it it fascinating to see these things behind the scenes that, that, that very rarely, uh, rarely get, uh, get told in, in the public eye. Um, at the Pentagon, and Chris, I don't think I've ever told you this story, but actually ISI saved my job at the Pentagon. So when I, when I came to work for Rumsfeld, and he invited me into his office, in the Secretary of Defense's office, and he said, I'd like you to be the chief speechwriter. And, uh, and I said, that, that's great, I'm very interested in doing it, but I want to discuss a few things with you first. And I said, the most important thing is, Mr. Secretary, is I need to have access to you. If you're gonna be, a speechwriter has, is really unique in the sense that you have to capture your boss's voice and his thinking, and in a, in a bureaucracy, there's a lot of people who want to tell you what the secretary should say, but the secretary knows what he wants to say. And the only way you can get that is if you're with him a lot. And so I said, I need to be there, not just when you're having a speech meeting, but in, in meetings when you're talking about what you want to do and something that might be a speech two years down the line. And so he said, you have free access to almost any meeting you want. And which was great uh, because I was able to capture his voice and, and capture his ideas. And also when people in the Pentagon bureaucracy said the secretary would never say that, I could say, well, I was just with him and he said that. Um, so, so I knew what he wanted. Um, but not everybody in the Pentagon liked that. Um, and there was a particular person who shall remain nameless um, who decided that it was wrong that I, was, that I had this direct access and I should be reporting to Rumsfeld through that person and decided to get rid of me and make my life miserable and get rid of me. And so one of the things this person did was they went out and got another speechwriter to come to the Pentagon as a senior advisor. Um, and this person took me aside and said, I just want you to know that you're gonna lose the speech writing shop and this person's gonna take over, you're gonna be gone. Um, and this person couldn't fire me because Rumsfeld, I had a good relationship with Rumsfeld, but they were trying to make my life miserable enough. And so the person they brought in to replace me was Tony Dolan, who was the former chief speech writer to President Ronald Reagan, uh, the man who wrote the Evil Empire speech. Um, he was there as a senior advisor, a counselor to, to Rumsfeld. And so he comes into my office um, and introduces himself and we start chatting and he asked me about myself, and I tell him about it. I was an editor in the college newspaper, how I got started, like that. And he said, well, what's, what's your political philosophy? And I said, I'm a fusionist. And he was eyes wide, and he's like, yeah, not a common answer you get, right? And, and uh, we started talking about Frank Meyer, and I talked to him, told him how about ISI had given me my first copy, uh, copy of In Defense of Freedom, and we figured out that we both knew Bill and all the rest of it. And within very short time, uh, he went to Rumsfeld and said, this person's crazy, Mark is great, and he, my, the person who was brought in to replace me actually became my strongest ally in the, in the organization, and it was all because of ISI. If ISI had not sent me a copy of In Defense of Freedom when I was a college student, and I decided then I was a fusionist, I would not have said that in that meeting, and I probably would not be here standing before you today. So, you know, thank you, Chris, and thank you, Ken Cribb, <laughs> for sending me that copy of In Defense of Freedom. Um, so, 
You know, in 2004, uh, after three great years uh, in the Pentagon, and by the way, that person, uh, person left before I did at the Pentagon. <laughs> Um, but in, in 2004, uh, I got a call from Mike Gerson, who was the chief speechwriter to President Bush, and said, we're going into election campaign, we're beefing up our, uh, our speechwriting staff, would you like to come over to the White House? Said, of course. Uh, you know, that's, anybody who's writing speeches, that's the, that's the dream. Um, and so I, I agreed, I uh, went over there, I worked for President Bush during, writing speeches during the 2004 campaign, after he won re-election. Bill McGurn came in as the chief speech to replace Mike as the chief speechwriter and asked me to be his deputy. And so for f almost f uh, four years there, four, three and a half years there, I was the I was the deputy director of speechwriting. Then I succeeded Bill as the chief speechwriter. Um, and boy, was that an amazing experience. I mean, I I was the lead writer on on two state of the worked on four state of the union addresses and uh, and was the lead writer on two of them. Uh, which was amazing, an amazing experience. In fact, one of my prized possessions I have was President Bush was always very gracious, and he would always uh, give the writers signed copies of the of the State of the Union address. They come in these little these little booklets with a red border and everything like that. And so I have four of them that I worked on. I, I first one I contributed one line. You know, I was just so happy to get a line into the State of the Union address. It was exciting. And by the end, I had I was the lead writer. And the first one is signed to Mark. Best wishes, George Bush. To Mar second one is to Mark. Good work. George Bush. Third one is great work, George Bush. And the fourth one is outstanding work, George Bush. And I always say, boy, I would have been in trouble if it went the other way around. <laughs> but but I, you know, I, got to, I got to write State of the Union addresses. I got to, I got to work on addresses to the nation uh, from, from, from the Oval Office. Um, and uh, you know, it, it, was it was just an incredible experience. Um, I recall one time, uh, you know, one of the things I was, I had a national security background, so one of the, uh, kinds of speeches, I would always get assigned the war on terror speeches. And one day I got called into the Oval Office by the President and he said, I'm, I want you to work on a particular speech having to do with the war on terror. Um, it had to do with, there was a big debate, I won't bore you with the details, but if, I don't know if you remember, there was a debate that Al-Qaeda in Iraq was not really Al-Qaeda. And so he wanted me to delve into the intelligence and find all the links between the two, work with the intelligence community, and then get it declassified, and he was gonna give a big speech showing the connection between bin Laden and al-Qaeda in Iraq. Um, and so I, I went off, and, and I had to write this on a, I had a classified laptop in my office that I kept in a safe. Uh, I couldn't tell anybody I was working on it because he didn't want anybody to know that he was working on it, so there's whole White House national, a lot of the, the staff didn't know it was there, it was happening except for Steve Hadley, who was the national security advisor. And so we write the speech, uh, I get it, I put it through the, through the clearance process, the uh, intelligence community declassifies it, and so it's the like, day before the speech is gonna be given, the president's seen it, but the senior staff hasn't seen it. And so all of a sudden it gets circulated, and the panic, the red lights start going off. You know, all these people, the president's giving a speech, major speech in the war on terror, we didn't know this was happening, we have to have our input, we have to, have, we have to work on it. Like that. So the president says, well, we're gonna have a speech meeting at the Oval Office at, uh, at 10 a.m. And so normally a speech meeting in the Oval Office is the speech writers, maybe if it's a national security speech, the national security advisor, uh, the communications, are, there's like 15 people there, and they all have opinions. <laughs> and so all of a sudden, they're saying, this doesn't work, and this is all wrong, and, the, and this has to be restructured, and everybody's got an opinion, and they're all moving in different directions. And the president says, okay, look, this is, this is a disaster. Uh, you, go, everybody go figure out what you want the speechwriters to put in it, give them your input, and we'll meet here, they'll fix it, and we'll come meet here at 220. So I walk out, and I'm just devastated. <laughs> this is a disaster, you know, the, the whole speech is given the speech tomorrow, like that. I, I get up to my office, Bill and I are sitting there, and we're like, what are we gonna do? And the phone rings, and it's Karen Keller, who's the president's secretary, and it says, the president wants to see you. And I'm like, oh no, we're gonna, get, we're gonna get beat up. So we walk in to the Oval Office, and he says, hey lads, you ready for the real speech meeting? <laughs> <laughs> and all of a sudden he says, here's what we're gonna do. Uh, the speech is great. Uh, here, we're going to make these changes. We had an hour meeting, went through it, uh, and you know, everybody else is sending us emails saying, here's our fix, like that, and we've got the president telling us, no, this is exactly what we're going to do. The chief of staff walks in, and, uh, and uh, he says, everything in the meeting, with everything okay? And the president says, boy, that was a cluster, wasn't it? And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and it's like, and the chief of staff uh, says, well, it looks like you've got the right cluster now. <laughs> 
And uh, so anyway, uh, we, we get the speech, we, we, uh, we go up there to 2.20 at the appointed time, and, uh, and the chief of staff asks him, do you want to call everybody back in? And he's like, we've had one cluster enough today, it's okay. Um, so th the point of the story being is that, you know, there's these impressions that George Bush was led by his advisors, that he was, uh, that he knew, he was, this is a man who knew exactly what he wanted to say, knew exactly what he believed you know, didn't, didn't need 15 advisors in the room to tell him what to do, and he gave the speech he wanted to give. Um, and uh, a lot of people didn't, that sometimes rub people the wrong way in the White House, but so be it. Um, my proudest experience with him was uh, working on uh, the speech that he gave in September 2006, revealing or acknowledging the existence of the CIA's interrogation program, the program that, in which uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and all these other terrorists had been waterboarded and gave us a lot of intelligence. At the time, this was even more top secret than the last speech I told you about. Um, this program, this was, this was the most highly classified program in, in the war on terror in the government. Um, and uh, so I was again called into the Oval Office to, to and the President told me he was gonna give this speech. Uh, wanted me to work with the intelligence community. At this point, I had to go and write it on a classified computer in the National Security, in a secure room in the National Security Council, so secure that it wasn't connected to the internet, and they actually used floppy drives to transfer material because, we, to print it, because literally you couldn't put enough information on one of these floppy drives to get anything out. I wish we still had this policy, we wouldn't have the Snowden problem. <laughs> but, but, you know, literally worked in a, in a, in a secret com compartmentalized room. My, my speech writing colleagues who didn't know what I was doing except I was working on another secret speech used to say I had, I had gone, when I went disappeared for days, I, I was at my, uh, at my undisclosed location. Um, but I was given access to the most top secret information we had about the war on terror, about, the, about this interrogation program. And, um, I know that one day I was asked to go over to a conference room at the NSC, and I was going to meet with some folks. They told me, just told me I was going to meet from some folks from the CIA who were going to brief me on this program. So I walked into the room, and I sat across from these, these three individuals, um, and I was introduced to them. They were introduced to me, explained the project, and they start talking to me and telling me stories and telling me how the techniques were applied, how the program worked, how it was very different from what you were reading in the newspapers. Um, how the intelligence that had gotten, the plots that had been broken up because of all this. And as I'm talking to them and listening to them, it slowly dawns on me that they're not talking about things that other people had done. These were the men who had run the program. I was sitting across from the man who had waterboarded Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. And he was telling me what he had done. And no one knew who this man was. No one knew this, this information. It was the most important story in the war on terror at that point, and no one knew anything about it. And I was sitting across from this man. And as I listened to them talk about the care they took to make sure that the detainees were hurt, about the value of the intelligence that they had produced, um, that had gotten from it, about the plots that were stopped, the multiple plots that were stopped uh, because of this information, um, I just realized I had to tell their story. And so we, we, we gave, the president gave a speech, which declassified a lot of information, but not, not nearly even a fraction of what I had learned. Um, and so when President, president Bush left uh, and President Obama came in, one of the first things he did was declassify all the, stop the program, first of all, which was a disaster. Uh, and two, declassify all the secrets about how this program worked, which was devastating to, the, to, to our national security efforts because most of the techniques were psychological. And so if you, if, you give, if you give away to somebody how the interrogation techniques work, they train in counter-interrogation, they can defeat them. You know, like one of the techniques was sleep deprivation. And so one of the details in the memos was that uh, you can only do their scientific studies that show how long you can deprive somebody of sleep before they have any kind of real damage to their, to so permanent damage. Um, and so we, wouldn't, we went, stopped well short of that. But some people responded differently, and there were, could be exceptions to that. So if the person was showing signs of self-destructive behavior or hallucinations, you had to cut off sleep deprivation. So now if you're a terrorist, you read that, what do you do? You train your people to fake hallucinations and do destructive behavior. So you're giving them a code book on how to defeat interrogation. So it was very destructive to put this information out. But it did something else, which is it freed someone like me who knew their story, who knew the truth about this, to finally speak out about it. So I wrote a book called Courting Disaster, which told the story of how this program came about, uh, the safeguards they took, why it wasn't torture, um, and why it was essential to the war on terror. And, I, and I, one of the reasons I did it was because I had met these men. 
and women, um, and knew them personally. They were my friends after, after working with them for several years in the White House. They're covert operatives. Their names and identities are secret even to this day. Um, and they were being called torturers in the media and at this point by their commander in chief. And I thought it was shameful and they couldn't tell their story. They couldn't speak up for themselves. So I was gonna do it for them and I did. Um, and fortunately, uh, I was blessed that that book became a New York Times bestseller and, and, and was the first shot back. Uh, since then, Jose Rodriguez and some of the other people who were involved in the program have written books as well. Um, but that gave me an opportunity to, uh, to, uh, uh, to, to, to take on a controversial issue. And you know, it's interesting uh, that the Washington Post, uh, which is not exactly a pro-waterboarding newspaper, uh, it was after I wrote that book, I submitted to them an op-ed defending the Enhanced Interrogation Program, Fred Hyatt, who I knew for years, uh, but I sent him a note saying, would you take this op-ed? Uh, it was a piece on explaining how I had caught Nancy Pelosi and the fact that she said she hadn't been briefed on it, but I, in my book, I revealed that she had been briefed by Jose Rodriguez and what he had told her. And so he wrote me back saying, uh, we'd love to publish it, and would you like to write a weekly column? <laughs> So, you know, I mean, Washington Post, a liberal paper, but they, they not only hired me um, as, as, as right wing as I am, but they hired me because of a column I wrote defending enhanced interrogation. So that's a, that's a, that's a heck of a statement. Uh, so I got to work at the Post. Uh, I, I became a weekly columnist um, at the American Enterprise Institute. Scott Walker asked me to help uh, write a book uh, telling his story, which, which recently came out. I've had just amazing experiences um, in, the, in the last few years. Um, from the Pentagon to the war, to traveling to war zones to working with the President of the United States in the Oval Office and on Air Force One to, to uh, you know, writing, writing books and columns for the Washington Post. And I guess my point to you tonight is simply it all began at the Collegiate Network. It all began because of this organization. And, you know, as I looked at these young students here uh, who are coming up to get their awards, you know, I saw myself 25 years ago. I was, I was you. Uh, I was a young student at a, a attending ISI conferences and, and thinking about the future, and I had no idea the adventures that I had uh, before me, the opportunities I would have to serve my country, uh, to, to affect the concerted calls, and all of that is ahead of you. You're going to have the same kinds of experiences, different than mine, but you'll, you'll, you'll chart your course, and 25 years from now, you're going to look back and say, to this night and to the experiences you had and say, it all started here. It all started because of ISI, the Collegiate Network, the Delaware Leadership Program. Um, and to all of you who are supporting ISI, you're making that possible. The, the people 25 years ago who were sitting in your seats at a dinner like this that provided the money that allowed me to publish The Vassar Spectator and to organize that uh, conservative meeting that introduced me to Bill Buckley, that set up a mentoring relationship, that set me off on my career and allowed me to do all those things. You know, th those, there were people like you who were sitting around a room 25 years ago, and 25 years from now, there's gonna be one of these kids is gonna be up here at a podium at an ISI conference saying, it was those people, it was all of you who made that possible for them. So I personally thank you for what you're doing for ISI. I thank you for what you're doing for these kids, and uh, uh, thank you for your support. Thank you.